I will turn the program over to, to our friend George Gula, who is joining us from Western Pennsylvania um, and is all, all ready to go to be our conductor today well, on am. our program about the Laurel Line. I'd given a much, much larger version of this show last year at a, at a meet with all trolley people. And, uh, you know, I, I've taken this, that's a postcard down on the bottom and, and uh, parts from a brochure they put out about 1903 or so. But... Uh, to get this started. Uh, there's actually more I can do. Uh, the black and white show that really discusses the early years uh, and the middle years of this line. But, uh, you know, and I can tell you about that while we're looking at all the uh, con contributors. Uh, there's Marianne's husband uh, right there, Robert uh, Sabakinas. And uh, I was hoping uh, Mr. Compass was going to be here. He loves the Northern Electric. And I need to talk about what the lower line was. And, you know, what it was, was an interurban. So you had streetcars becoming very successful uh, by about uh, 1890. And, uh, you know, ours was early, but, you know, not as good as what they would become. And by about 1900, 1895 to 1900, there was a big boom to start building these things, not only within the city, but connecting different cities off through the countryside. There's Clark Summit on the bottom, and that's the bottom of Clark Summit Hill um, on the top. And you could really compete with railroads. They were cheaper to build. Um, and uh, that's what the Laurel Line was supposed to be. And here it is from Carbondale uh, coming through with Scranton at a central terminus and, you know, running down through the valley. Um, all the way down into Wilkesboro, and there were projections to go to Nanticoke, and unfortunately, it only went from Wilkesboro uh, to Scranton, and this little bit to Dunmore, that's what happened, and somehow what happened was the capitalists were going to build a, just a very good interurban line uh, to connect all the mid-valley towns, uh, the uptowns, the down, uh, the towns down lower uh, between Carbondale and Nanticoke, uh, they had done studies, it looked very good, uh, and then this guy showed up. We don't know much about him, but George Lee, uh, who established the transit contract company to build this thing, uh, decided there was much more money to be made in freight. And he wanted to go ahead and, and uh, you can see all the different railroads in the valley here, two different places. Uh, but down in Wilkesboro, coming down up, well, coming up the Susquehanna was the Pennsylvania Railroad. And he decided, we'll take all that freight from the Pennsylvania Railroad and, you know, we'll, we'll just run it up to Carbondale and we'll give it to the New York, Ontario and Western. And they in turn will go to New England uh, and they will give it to the New Haven for distribution through New England. Now, they didn't ask the railroads what they thought about this. For example, the Pennsylvania Railroad never talked to electric lines um, and that never happened. So here's the Laurel Line um, as it finally uh, was built. And Pittston was the only town on the line. Um, and here's a little more detail in Scranton. So just to show you what would happen, it would come out. Here's the current trolley line going through the Crown Avenue tunnel. It was built in 1905. But the original line came up, what is the Central Scranton Expressway today? And the Laurel Junction was here. Um, they had a very nice curve that was going to take you through Dunmore, Ash Street, Naog, uh, and continue up to, uh, off, of, off the map to Archibald. This was always a very tight turn. This was temporary, uh, but they were going to build another nice turn, nice curve, and go along what is now the, uh, hmm, the northbound lanes of I-81. Uh, never happened, uh, but you can still ride it. And here is what it's going to look like if you show up after uh, 1905, the uh, terminal was right here. Uh, next to that was a very beautiful freight house. They had a yard over here. There were two tracks serving what was known as the excursion platform. And we know it's after 1908 because the station, the DLNW station has been built um, and the station was located on Cedar Avenue. And I've sometimes in the early days seen that called Mattis Avenue and they must have changed it and you're good, you can get off the streetcar. You could walk um, or take a taxi to the station and you're gonna get on one of these big cars, um, beautiful cars. Now this was the last series of cars built in the mid twenties. And this is seen, seen looking west from the Mulberry, uh, Spruce Street Bridge, I'm sorry. And it shows some of the yards. It shows the, the freight house here. Uh, there's West Side up here. And I believe that's St. Anne's. Um, you can see the railroad over here. Um, on the right and you'll leave the terminal and you'll usually pass these locomotives that are switching. There were three of them. The first locomotive 401 was built out here in Pittsburgh uh, where I'm sitting 
at the Westinghouse plant in 1895. Westinghouse was using it to uh, uh, begin his experiments with AC. And uh, Westinghouse actually helped to construct this line or an arm of Westinghouse, uh, Westinghouse Church Kerr. Um, and when the Laura line was looking for his first engine, they had this decrepit thing sitting on the side and they said, of course, uh, we have one. And uh, so here's the, uh, here we are heading to the car house. Um, Ridge Row um, is up here. I think the Caitlin house is just off, off the picture. Sorry, Sarah. But uh, uh, an overhead shot uh, that you guys uh, had from the deal in W um, after Hurricane Diane, but it does show the location of the car house and they had a powerhouse. Uh, the Roaring Brook here uh, is being relocated and you can see the original line coming up the hill. And uh, most of those buildings are, are are here off to the left. This is gone. This was Sprux Lumber, which was a major customer. And then you looked off the Harrison Avenue Bridge, uh, and it sure looks like uh, the Electric City Trolley Museum today. Uh, they're still running on that area. And uh, another shot of the bridge. That bridge has been replaced. Actually, both, both bridges now have been replaced. Um, Harrison Avenue Bridge, I think the new one just opened. Uh, and here we are going into the 4,750 foot long tunnel. Being on the train a couple of times. Oh. Sarah, are you having trouble? No, I'm fine, George. Keep going. Okay, good. I don't know. I just heard some things. So, south side of the tunnel um, around Stafford Avenue, uh, and you'll emerge uh, from that tunnel uh, and you will turn directly to the what was called the new South Scranton Station. There's the old pool that's up here, uh, which I don't think is there today. The old South Scranton Station was on what is now the interstate at Maple Street. So we're looking uh, on the top toward the tunnel, which is around the bend. And there's the there's Stafford Avenue, which has been replaced. Uh, Ed Miller loved to climb hills, and he climbed this one. He's on the Erie Railroad, the Erie and Wyoming Valley. There's Stafford Avenue over here. I uh, remember finding this cemetery uh, was kind of scary. There was a statue of somebody crucified there, and but he got a great shot of Scranton. And uh, you can see the gas tanks are down in here somewhere. My neighborhood here, you can even see my high school if you look hard. And right after that comes a typical freight. They never really carried many cars on this line. Uh, most of the coal was tied up uh, with the railroads that owned the mines. And now uh, we're down in the area below the interstate. The interstate's up above, we're going south. And they had these rock quarries down here at one time. They, they actually got the rock for the ballast that held the track. You can see some of it there um, from their own quarries. This is uh, Connell Junction. And that is named for William Connell uh, that we talked about last week. And he, at that point, was a representative, US representative, Senator, but um, I believe he was also uh, one of the promoters uh, of the Laurel Line. Typical freight, uh, a lot of this traffic was calm, which went to their power plant uh, to, produce, uh, to produce the power. And there's a little bit of the junction, the old line uh, coming up in here. The track was in place for quite a while. Here's a northbound car at the same place. There's a southbound freight train or a northbound freight train. Uh, it's allowing the dispatchers allowing that car to pass, and it will come into the tunnel, uh, run through the gauntlet track, and and uh, under dispatchers' orders, pretty much on the wrong track. This bridge is still there. We still ride it when we're running the streetcar. And now we're down at what was called Virginia. Virginia, they had hoped would have some industries put in, never happened. Uh, but the wooden bridge was put in for anybody that needed to cross the track. And in 1947, they built a freight line here uh, that's going to go up. Um, switchback uh, originally served a coal breaker and now would be running up to Davis Street or uh, some industries that were put in in 1947. And we're gonna fly down through the woods towards Rocky Glen, about, about a mile and a half, two miles from Virginia. This was typically what the line looked like. Note the third rail, 600 volts uh, in this third rail powered the uh, cars and then we'll get down by uh, Rocky Glen Lake. 
and we will approach Rocky Glen. Now, Rocky Glen had water on both sides there. You can see it was a causeway that's still there built. Uh, there was a bridge that's not there, so you pretty much have to swim 20 feet. Uh, or if you want to follow the line, like the bridge is over here, you're, you're going to have to walk or drive quite a bit. The original roller coaster came over the tracks. My mother remembers that down into the valley. I think it was called a Pippin, if I'm not mistaken. And then Ben Sterling, who would wind up with ownership of the park, built this, the Million Dollar Roller Coaster. And the Million Dollar Roller Coaster cost just around $100,000. Um, and everybody took a picture here. I think it was almost as long, though, as the Crown Avenue Tunnel, and it was a 96 or 98-foot drop. Uh, there is the station. Uh, the old roller coaster is still running. You can see it on that side. The regular main part of the park's over on my right. And this this station originally had a wooden platform by about 1918 or 19. It had rotted out. And from then on, the platform was um, uh, not even asphalt. It was pretty much cinders. Calm was ready, readily available um, in this area. In 1952, last year of service to the park. And you can see just how desolate the line seems to be. The signals were added after the 1920 accident, five trains and a lot of casualties, uh, a collision in South Pittston. And the sidings were basically used for the freight, freight switching because there was a small coal breaker just south of the park, just south of the park. Um, but that's typical of the locomotives that were running. 401 is the original, 1895. Uh, locomotive. That was the first freight locomotive built in the United States. First electric uh, freight locomotive. And looking from uh, Rocky Glen Road, they did have a bridge because of the third rail. And you can see the freight cars are sitting there. So some something is down beyond the photographer and it's switching. Um, and there's the steps leading up to the park. And another shot of that pretty rickety bridge. Today, you can't tell whether there was a bridge there. The road just kind of runs through. And uh, I walked into pieces of the park uh, to uh, examine the uh, to examine the causeway. Uh, now, Bob Savakinas was kind enough to let me see that. You'll let you see that. So you can see the, the park over here. You can see how the line's going to come across, uh, serve the station, go under Rocky Glen Road. And right in here, oops, sorry, hit that. Right over here is a breaker, one of the few actual coal breakers served by the Laurel Line. It's at the foot of the number four plane of the Pennsylvania Gravity Railroad. And on the other side, you can't see it through the trees, was a small coal washery, uh, which also uh, will provided business for the system. There's that breaker, and you can see it's not what we typically think of when we think of a northeastern Pennsylvania coal breaker. As, as the word said, pretty ramshackle. <laughs> You're going to head down under, well, I don't know that the turnpike was there. You will go under the turnpike if you look for it now. Cross Springbrook, and this little piece of a bridge was for the Springbrook Railroad, which by 1952 was not there. Um, and Ed Miller is standing on the Erie Railroad, and so you can see the music station. There's 502. Uh, there's the music station, you know, wonderful platforms here. And it's going to duck under the Erie Railroad. It's, it paralleled the Erie Railroad quite a bit from uh, Pittston all the way up into Scranton. Hard to see this today. Some of it's been covered over. There's a big trucking lot up above. In this area, there was a 1922-23 uh, robbery. West End Coal Company payroll was robbed by five men. Um, all identified as Italians by the paper, and eventually all uh, all caught, pretty much mostly all shot uh, during their um, during their catching. <laughs> that is Powder Mill Road, and today the interstate's right over to the left, and you have to climb an embankment to get to this uh, location. And we're heading south uh, beyond Powder. We're going to start uh, through Music, heading into Avoca, and we're at the county line. And the scenery is about to change. It goes from this wonderful verdant green scenery to what, you know, is typical. And it'll stay like that pretty much all the way down into Wilkesboro. Uh, 
This is Brown's Patch, uh, just out the Duryea, and they're they're mining comb. They're taking comb out of here. It was a former coal operation. I'm not not. I'm trying to think of this hillside coal and iron. Uh, the Avoca station is over here. And this is some of the operations here. Is they, this comb was used primarily in the power plant. So if they could get their hands on big comb piles cheaply, you know, 70, 75 cents a ton, uh, they did very well. And of course, uh, they, were able to, they were able to burn all this fine sized coal where most steam locomotives uh, weren't able to do that. Here is the substation. Uh, this helps to boost the power on the line when they started to add freight locomotives. They didn't have enough power. It's DC powered. So the farther you go from the power plant, um, the lower the voltage. And they had to build two of these eventually. Here's the one at Avoca. And it is going to step up the uh, voltage here. And they're switching. That's Plain Street in the back. Um, and I'm standing, in fact, or Ed's standing, in fact, on Plain Street. So there's another shot of the uh, uh, substation. And you can't really see this well today, but if you really look at an embankment, you're going to see the concrete that helped support the bridge. And you're going to, uh, the problem with the lower line was that they spent almost $12 million building a line for freight service. They didn't want a whole lot of crossings uh, and they couldn't go through the center of town with that, you know, that highest standard of railroad. And so a lot of people had to walk quite a bit uh, to get to the train. South Street was an ex exception here in South of Oka. Um, you had to cross the road and they, this is one of the few crossings that were signaled. And Ed Miller told me that a two car train would actually lose contact uh, with power momentarily. Nothing, you know, we had no, and so if it had to stop, it couldn't get started until something came from behind to push it. And so they just came rolling through here, bells ringing, you know, horns, all kind of noise being made, and they still had quite a few accidents, even with uh, these these signals put in. Uh, and the interstate today is just above to the right, and we're heading south, and much of Avoca is down in that little valley, uh, or below the car. And we're going to get to this, the 682 foot long Avoca, or some people call it the Heidelberg trestle. And I believe they use Heidelberg because just off to the left, you see the, the hopper cars over there. That was the Lehigh Valley Coal Company's Heidelberg breaker. Um, the DNH came through here. The Lehigh Valley came through here eventually. I think this made the Guinness Book of Records with five different levels of transportation. Two railroads, the Laurel Line, the airplanes flying over to the Avoca Airport, and Route 11, which is, which is really right over here. Um, there's a, a shot from the south portal of it, the hill from the south portal. Um, it was pretty high, and the highest was about 100 feet. A bunch of spans, and you can see it cost a lot of money. And this is 1947, two-car train. There's Route 11 over uh, to the left. And another shot of the typical freight train. Some hoppers uh, at the end of the line were fruit and meat producers so you know you'll always see a bunch of refrigerator cars uh, tacked onto the train and we're going to head south um, and now we're curving around and we're passing DuPont. DuPont is off to the right. Um, there was a lot of cave-ins going on. There was a lot of subsidence. They were constantly filling uh, the line in as fast as it fell sometimes the same areas would fall in and at one point that Avoca Viaduct actually had subsidence in some of the uh, bridge abutments and anybody missing a shot of DuPont there it is and you can see again how far away from the middle of the town uh, the Laura line was because of its aspirations to haul 40 car freight trains. This is the this is a north uh, a southbound car, and we've just passed over Route 11. That's this big skewed bridge here, um, and a lot of people look at this, and uh, of course they're not from northeastern Pennsylvania. They can't believe all of this mine scarring. Uh, much of it was done uh, by the uh, Pennsylvania Coal Company, the Erie operated Pennsylvania Coal Company, and there's more of it. That's the Butler Breaker or where the Butler Breaker would have been, uh, last operated, I believe, by Volpe. Uh, in the end, the, by the 30s, the mob was getting into coal mining, so. There's the Laura Line bus. Maybe some of you remember the 
corner of Linden Street and Adams is silver and uh, yellow and green bus uh, would be sitting there and that would take over the Loreline business, bus uh, rail business afterwards. Uh, but we're approaching North Pittston. There were three stations in Pittston. This is Cork Lane. Uh, there was a tremendous subsidence here uh, about 1918, 1920. And uh, quick thinking by a passenger who was waiting, got both the north and southbound trains stopped before they went into a big hole uh, that showed up right about here. That's typical freight. That's the Erie Railroad uh, over on the left. And uh, this is looking north near William Street. Now we're going down into the valley and you can't see anything today, you know, unless you want to get tick bites. Um, you're not going to see the right of way as it goes down the hill and into Pittston. And uh, parts of Pittston and their churches are seen in the background. Mountains to the west. And we're going to come around a curve here. That's the Erie Railroad in front. And they had all the freight business in this town. Um, there was a small freight house off to the right. The passenger station was there, and there was an unfortunate accident that took place here. The young young boy was running down the hill, couldn't stop, and, uh, you know, got fried on the third rail. My mother used to tell me all sorts of stories about kids who would want to dare each other to walk the third rail. And if you jumped on that rail with two feet, you could stand on it, and you could walk on it, and you're not going to get hurt. But most people would slip, and the first thing they do is try to get their footing, and they would make a, uh, they would ground themselves and make a circuit. This is the um, only other big station besides Scranton and Wilkesboro, and this was over at uh, Pittston at Market Street, and there was a freight house behind it. The freight house is still there, being uh, used for other purposes. And this was a place where they turned the trains. Special days at Rocky Glen. Um, like Russian Day, Italian Day, Greek Day, um, they wouldn't run the trains all the way down to Wilkesboro when they had extra trains. They would turn them around at Pittston uh, because in Wilkesboro there were other parks that people uh, could go to, like Sansui. And there we are turning them around. And, you know, this is what we do sometimes at the trolley museum. You know, you cross over. Um, I would have had to put my poles up back pull up, front pull down, they would switch the seats on the inside. In this case, all you did was bring my control levers uh, from back to front and I'm ready to go. And then we'll cross Main Street. We're paralleling, as you can see, the Erie Railroad. And uh, I'm going to go through a Pizza Hut here, and uh, which is what's there today. And the Erie had an interchange here. They also interchanged freight at Dunmore. Um, but after the Dunmore line disappeared about 1946, all the interchange with the Erie Railroad, where cars came from to or from one railroad to another, uh, was done down here. And that's the Erie over on the left. And now we're at South Pittston, Welsh Street. Hard to see where some of this is. A lot of trees. The houses are still there. But, um, and that was a typically typical coal freight. Pretty long, actually shot from Wall Street. Right here, right here is where the accident occurred uh, in 1920. Uh, the number of people died, a lot of injured, uh, three cars totally destroyed out of a five-car train, and this prompted the line that ran very frequent service finally to put in electric automatic signals. Before that, everything was done on train orders. Now, just a short distance down was Thompson Street, you can drive here today and you're going to look at it and say, where am I? Uh, there's all new homes today in this mining country. And uh, I remember this is up from the dump that's gotten bigger uh, here. Uh, and this is what it looked like. Uh, the Erie Thompson Street was up here. Here's the Erie Railroad and a mining railroad up here. Uh, that street's heading the, the line to, or the street to Plains up here. You can see the mine here. And... Uh, this abutment is still there. How do I know? Uh, because uh, my wife and I would drive home from visiting my folks and I would ask uh, if we could drive by here so I could see where the hell this was. And she finally said, let me drive. And so I was able to see where this was. Now, this is all new homes here and here. You can't tell, you know, where anything was. You can't see number six pond that's uh, down on the, uh, on the lower right. There's the abutment again. Uh, that's the Ewan breaker, and there's still some sort of a smaller breaker there. Uh, 
the guy was mowing his grass in the yard and I went over and asked him if I can look at the abutment. And he said, sure. He said, let me tell you about the concrete abutment I had to tear down. That was the one at Thompson Street. Uh, so he would not have that in his front yard. But uh, Ed Miller's favorite picture, and it really shows some of the uh, mining activity here. And then they would just haul a coal off to the left, the breaker, and that's number six pond. And once again, the dispatcher has the northbound passenger train moving past the freight train, uh, which has orders to be on the southbound track. That's the old Pittston Hospital. Not even sure if that building is there today. And we are heading south through the coal lands, uh, Erie Railroad Bridge in the background. Ed and I just love this area. And, uh, but, but look at how scarred it is as you start heading down uh, towards Inkerman. Just, just, uh, you have a good view of the third rail. 600 volts direct current. A lot of people risked their lives crossing over this because there were so few bridges, underpasses, um, or crossings on this line. And um, newspapers will show you some disastrous results. Now, we're going to turn from that dump and look down. There's the Susquehanna River. Um, this is the magnificent station at Inkerman. And uh, it, uh, I think, was it here that, yeah, here, there was a park at one time called Valley View Park. It was not like Rocky Glen. They had no uh, amusements at all. It was more of a picnic park. Uh, but it was very popular, at least till about 1920. Just, just, you know, and you can see there's really nobody down there. Today there's housing, uh, still a lot of trees, uh, but they're running through down the plains and there's literally nobody there in this very desolated area. Um, you can still sort of see where the line is because of the roadbed. Uh, I would not walk the line unless you like ticks. And you're going to head down here to number 14. Number 14 was a later station. It was an original. But when they opened the colliery at number 14, then they uh, uh, put the station in for miners. Gives you a good view of what people had to wait through and wait, wait under for a train and bad weather. And this area is kind of interesting. Uh, the original main line came down here for some reason. They didn't fill this in for about 10 years. Uh, and cars had a slow order and they came down here much later than there was a brickworks. And later still, there was this little coal loading facility here. And that was the last industry to use this, uh, this area. Now, there's the electric locomotive hauling cars up and down. Uh, these engines had uh, the ability to really, uh, I mean, they, 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 they could really pull where the smaller diesels that replaced it couldn't, and then they had to get a much bigger diesel. I think, they could, I think the term was they could overload the engine, the electric engine. And these were company employees that would roll the cars down with the handbrakes after they were set. Um, so now we're, we're just, you can see this main line today behind people's homes on the right. And we're flying down over Sailor Street at Hilldale. And we're gonna come then to uh, back under Main Street it went, uh, went over and then back under. And uh, this is North Plains. And then you can see North Plains right up here. And Ed's in the, uh, Ed Miller uh, knew the substation operator, Harold Mackler. And so he was able to come up and shoot a picture of a northbound car here. And they had a freight house at one time too. And in fact, I remember seeing this whole area when I got here before the new houses went in, the entire concrete base for this building was still there. So there is a picture somewhere. And that's Harold Mackler, the substation operator. And uh, we'll head down through Plains. Uh, the school is still there. So that locates this, that's the Maffitt School. I'm sitting on Helen Street. And today, if you sit here, you're gonna look at somebody's house. And I remember, kind of figuring out where this cut was and the person came out and you know what are you doing with this camera and I told them and they told me oh we had to put so much dirt in to fill this up to build our house here now if you look the other way you can see through the trees that this is still here here's the dumps from the uh, Lehigh Valley uh, prospect breaker the Maffin school is here and this is a spur that went into sin cabbage lumber uh, Sun Cabbage is still there, but of course, no longer served by railroad. And notice the overhead wire because 
they didn't want third rail at any of these industrial sightings where people had to walk around on a couple cars, couple cars, and they would put in trolley wire. They also put the trolley wire into Wilkesboro at the request of the city government. So uh, here we are at Midvale, Midvale Station. And we are now heading past Prospect uh, Breaker. There was a coal miner that kept walking over the tracks at night after a shift and, and one day he hit the third rail and it made a lot of news. Um, that's a great shot of the Lehigh Valley Breaker, which eventually um, ended in a fire. And we are now starting to cross uh, Main Street, River, River Street, not Main Street, I'm sorry, there's the breaker again. Uh, northbound car on the south side of the viaduct. And uh, yeah, eBay's wonderful. I found this and this is a shot I'd always coveted. I mean, I said, did somebody ever stand on the railroad bridge uh, which this guy is, and shoot this whole area, and there it is. And so you can see this very huge 550-some-foot uh, viaduct there. Uh, they had to relocate railroads. They had to relocate uh, roads in order to put this in. Uh, we're now going to go along the Susquehanna River for our mile, mile-and-a-quarter entrance into Wilkesburg. There's another freight. So you, get a, you see the, uh, the river curving north. And another shot taken from the middle of the railroad bridge. Ed Miller stood out here, and I guess nobody nobody stopped him. They would today uh, on the bridge and uh, shot this great picture here. And uh, there's the Wilkesboro Connecting Railroad Bridge uh, built around 1935 or so by the defunct, uh, uh, let's see, New Year, what was it? Uh, it was a branch of the Susquehanna, Wilkesboro and Eastern, uh, it, what, what it was. And it's still being used today. Um, much of this is gone. There's another Pizza Hut here. Um, you can't see a whole lot except you can see this bridge. Standing on its own, Mill Creek Bridge, um, where the first Wyoming massacre took place, uh, where Indians massacred Connecticut settlers about 10 years before the Wyoming massacre took place. And that bridge is still there. You can see it. Um, we'll pass the Dorrance Breaker. The cemeteries um, on River Street are off beyond the breaker to the left. Um, again, the Lehigh Valley served this breaker and the Laurel Line got no business from it. It became a passenger line primarily and a terminal uh, switching railroad for its freight. Uh, never really got long haul freight, which is where all the money is. We're gonna pass the gas works uh, approaching uh, North Street. And at this point, Wilkesboro is entered, and Wilkesboro did not want the third rail. It's like, you're right in the middle of our city. We don't want this. So they had to put the overhead trolley up. And the conductors got used to pulling the pole down or putting it up on the wire as the car kept moving. And that's the gas tanks. When we talked about them at the uh, Scranton show, that's the kind of gas tank that would go up and down with the volume. North Street, there was a lot of accidents at North Street. Can anybody see why? You couldn't see the car, even with the uh, signal up above. And we'll make the curve around the uh, Luzerne County Courthouse, which is off the picture, out of the picture to the right. And there were some Lehigh Valley tracks here, and you can see they're gone now in 1952. Um, another shot of that. In fact, you were able to put the... Uh, put a shelter on, on that. And then we'll just go down a few blocks. I remember at one time, never got a picture of it, but the poles still had these uh, bars that, that would uh, contain the overhead wire. Um, you're going down about three blocks. This was at one time a canal, and then it became the Lehigh Valley Railroad. And the uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad had to move its tracks off to the left in order for the lower line to put its tracks in. And that bus over to the left is not a bus. It's an electric trolley bus. Then take a look at some of the overhead wires. Um, it's a bus with electric motors and uh, much more efficient. Wilkesboro had a huge trolley bus system, uh, which ran until 1958. And they were entering, you're getting near the terminal, but I'm not going to use the southbound track anymore. You know, I'm renting it out uh, for a spur track so Pomeroy's could have their warehouse there. And uh, it was so little business that I would be able to go in and out on the northbound track. Here's 401, the fabled 1895 locomotive. Uh, too bad nobody was able to save it back then. 
but it went to the scrap heap uh, with everything else. And now we're going to enter the terminal at Wilkesboro. We're crossing uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Thomas C. Thomas is still down there. They were a shipper. Swift was um, as well. Wilson and Company was also there. That's the freight house that they built and later leased out to other companies over on the right. And right over here is the connection they had with the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Here's the terminal down here. So we're heading in. There's the train actually switching cars, giving either giving or taking cars from the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Uh, these were facilities described, though, by before 1915, you know, as facilities you couldn't duplicate at any price. I don't think that impressed the railroads. There's the Wilson building. You're going through some very fancy slip switches, as you can see. And uh, that building, I believe, was the building for the Wilkesboro and Hazleton, which was another electric line that went between those two cities. Um, and finally, we're at the terminal. Now, we'll talk four or five minutes about, not even that long, Sarah, about the Dunmore line. There was a the line that went to Dunmore. Originally, the line, all the mainline cars went up here under the Harrison Avenue Bridge. That's why that arch is there. And uh, they would continue to run cars simply to Dunmore until 1946. When all the other mainline trains were going under here to the station, you would have uh, the Dunmore line. And I showed you earlier that kind of three-piece, they would come over to Dunmore, you know, kind of back up to Maple Street, which became the terminal, and uh, back into Scranton. They never carried too many people here. The double track main line is gone. You can see down below the main line, there's the uh, powerhouse and the car house, and a nice view of Scranton. Um, and today, if you drive from Dunmore and start to come in to Scranton on the Central Scranton Expressway, you're going to wonder why that curve was so beautiful, and it wasn't because of the expressway. The Laura Line had put this in originally as what would to be their main line to Carbondale. It's a very nice, easy curve. And then they had stations like this at Ash Street in Naog, and people kind of wandered out of the woods to board here uh, if they wanted to. And they finally got down to Dunmore. Uh, we're kind of above where the interstate is. Here's the old Erie Railroad shops. I believe the Naples now owns this. And uh, the, the, the line, this is after the line line was gone, but you can see the bridge where its station would have been. So people had to walk down from Smith Street and Chestnut to get to the Laura Line. And uh, this bridge is still here. Here's where the freight track was to interchange with the Erie Railroad. And there was the Quinn Coal Company, just about a quarter mile up beyond that to the right. And you can see that mar marvelous building on the bottom. I used to see this bridge when I would ride the rides at Nayog Park. Now, the other thing, one or two slides, 1947, uh, the uh, uh, Scranton Chamber of Commerce uh, basically built the line um, up here to Davis Street, where the cemeteries are. Uh, it crawled up the hill like the line still does today. Um, here was the old Moffat coal breaker, and they just used rail from the Dunmore line to come up. And there were three or four industries here. GE uh, was, I know, I know was there, and Harris Hub was there as well. And they would climb this hill like this and uh, just, you know, I think the Hampton Inn um, up here, the Hampton Inn's up here. And this is uh, Kane Street and Davis Street, and little dirt roads um, that uh, are still pretty badly paved, but paved. And that's what the, uh, that's what it looked like. Now, you know, we got to come to an end here. So I'm going to give you a little ending. Um, and the ridership naturally, like everybody else's ridership, was beginning to decline after World War II. And you can see those numbers. You know, everybody gets their cars back. They're, they're able to relicense their cars. They start buying new ones two years later. Uh, the ridership's down 78%. You know, there, there is, you know, a fair increase. It doesn't matter. The revenues are down. And they have bonds coming due. And they've already restructured once. And I told you, it cost about $12 million. And the bonds are coming due about 1949 or so, 48 or 49. And uh, then there's a strike, you know, which, which gives uh, the receiver, and they're in receivership by that time. There's no hope now. And we're going to abandon a passenger service. And, and here it is um, in 1950. Uh, 1953, the Laura Line bus service will begin. Uh, that's run by the Price Bus Company. Some of you might remember the Price 
uh, bus company. Here's the last day Ed Miller took this picture. And one of the interesting things is, uh, is this fellow uh, who bought the first ticket in Pittston in 1903. Uh, what, Joseph Fitzpatrick and, you know, a whole bunch of crew members. Hennigan's here, the superintendent of transportation. And the freight continues as before. And it continues to run the electric freights. Although, although towns like Pittston are now asking to kill the third rail in their town and, and put up the overhead wire. And so there we are in Plains on the top and of course Scranton on the bottom. And, you know, they decide why keep all the electric stuff running? We're running two trains a day. Um, and uh, the receiver, a man named Waters, uh, decides to lease a diesel from the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western. And the trains, the trains electrically are going to run until August 19th, and the morning train certainly does that. But the diesel runs in the afternoon because somebody discovered that in the newspaper, uh, an article had been printed, or one of the newspapers, that the third rail is now dead. And they didn't want people, you know, doing stupid things. So, you know, they started to pick up the track very quickly. Uh, nine or ten miles of uh, line will eventually be on the Erie when the deal and W and the Erie merge in 1962. Um, and here are the cars, the remaining cars sitting up uh, in Child's freight yard up in uh, Mayfield. And I remember seeing these, my mother uh, would drive up to see a friend up in Forest City and these would all be lined up. And I never really knew what they were, but they were there. <laughs> and the freight traffic would continue to fall. And they do use the Lackawanna diesel, you know, the Lackawanna would eventually buy the line and none of the, none, nothing would change. Same trains running, a morning train uh, and a late afternoon train and everything. And 357 was usually the engine um, that was utilized and the traffic would start to dry up more and more. Uh, then the merger, this is at the condition of the line. Uh, by about 1962 or so, but uh, things were really falling apart and uh, eventually the business on the bottom end would dry up and even later um, there would be Penn Central, which was a railroad fiasco, the merger of two of the biggest railroads, New York Central and Penn, Pennsylvania Railroad, and as a result they would form Conrail and Conroe would start sucking up all the railroads in our area as well. Most of Northeastern Pennsylvania's railroads were, were brought in. And uh, eventually, by about 1985, you can see the old line here, Conroe would stop running anything through the tunnel. The in, all the industries up at Davis Street would start using trucks. So this is what it looks like today. It would become a parking lot not that paved, but uh, the University of Scranton would eventually uh, get a hold of this. You, know, you can see the Scranton Yard, uh, which is going to become part of Steamtown. And things are going to come down. For some reason, it took three years to take that big bridge down at Avoca. It was coming down in pieces. And uh, the freight house, that freight house, if you go over and look today, it's disguised. There is buildings built around it. Um, there is something there. Uh, this is the road, I think, going into the furnaces, but it's still there. And that car house, go down and take a look at it. Drive down and you'll see it's a plastics plant with stuff added on. That's still there. Um, the station is not still there. Unfortunately, that was taken down with the powerhouse 1967 when the Central Scranton Expressway was coming through. And they demolished it. And the paper was wrong because in, I remember I mentioned Wilkesburg and Hazleton and the Laurel Line, and you had to make connections to get down to Hazleton. And the paper uh, didn't make that difference. They just said, you can go all the way down. Is the station all gone? Sarah, this one's for you. No, I'm sure you're laughing right now. Um, but this stayed in place. There was the, the, the concrete platform stayed in place. Uh, from 1952 all the way into the late 90s. And I would wander down on that platform and then one day I discovered this. This is all that beautiful tile, the four colored tile. That's how I know it's four color mm -hmm. uh, because that's no longer sitting there. I got a hold of it before the University of Scranton did. Um, <laughs> it is now in my basement. So, <laughs> yeah, I knew you were gonna laugh with it. I have it, I, I do, I have a, a number of things. <laughs> Take a look at my hat, and you'll see it's a conductor's hat uh, from the Laurel. <laughs> and if you read the book um, that Ed Miller helped to uh, put together, um, I think Muncie and Henwood actually uh, did the authoring. Uh, 
there was a, a line at the end that said, there might still be a chapter to, be, to write about the Laurel Line. That book came out about 1985. And indeed there is, because today you could ride up to Montage Mountain uh, on a streetcar. And freight still runs through the tunnel. Uh, the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western runs their trains back up the Minooka branch um, to switch plastic plants. Um, and they're still doing that too. So the ghost of the Laurel Line really, really still runs. And here is the tunnel opening and Ed Miller, of course, who loved the Laurel Line, was very sad when it went away, was absolutely ecstatic, rode the first car and he's next to me, standing next to me, uh, taking this picture at the south end of the tunnel. And the tunnel, in fact, is named for Edward S. Miller. Um, and that, that is there at the south end of the tunnel. You can actually read that today, um, honoring him uh, for chronicling the line so well. And with that, I am open to questions. Thank you very much, George. Thank you for, for sharing your, your images. Um, they, some of them were, they weren't exactly pretty, but I think one of your, your captions from Inkerman talked about um, a lunar landscape. And it's, it's an important story that, that we tell about coal mining, but it is, it is a vanished landscape. Um, so it was, it was interesting to see what, what used to be there, um, as you pointed out, what is now so often covered with housing developments. Thanks for a great presentation. Well, yes, thank you for having me. Really great. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Great job, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, George. And thank everybody for, for joining in. Um, next week, we will be doing another program at two o'clock. Um, we'll be doing some time traveling again next week. Um, we'll be jo joined by Civil War General Gibbon, um, who will talk about his experiences during the war. Um, so again, next Friday at two o'clock, um, please tune in for another Lackawanna Pastimes program. Um, and have a lovely weekend, everybody. <laughs>